next session. And, and you're going to give all the uh, intros and um, explain what is going to happen. So, that's Handing over. Thank you very much. We're just trying to get this presentation on now. Uh, so, welcome to the dealing room now. It's going to be like the most anticipated uh, session, I guess. Okay, there it is. We're back. So, what will we going to do in the next 16 minutes? Maybe a little even bit more time, if you are so kind to give us a bit more time. Um, we are going to show you in this session right now how to negotiate with investors. Because if you're going to be successful in, with your pitches, and you're going to come to that moment where you're going to sit in a room with an investor, he's given you a term sheet, and you're going to have to negotiate in that. And you know, in order to be prepared in that, I'm going to be like too surprised at that moment. We're going to do it like one time here for you. So closely follow my beautiful and perfect panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce them in a second. Um, so we're going to work through the term sheet a bit, and there's going to be like a, a, a you know, a, Example investment that we're prepared for you, which is going to be like a bit like you guys are, early stage company, you know, just got to the market, just got a bit traction in the market already, uh, just looking for you know, an investment of about like 200,000 euro, uh, and we're going to have an investor who's already, uh, these yeah. guys met already before, I mean, he, she, she already pitched, and uh, she already got some, some attention from an investor, and he says, like, yeah, let's do that, but now we're going to have to negotiate. So, and that's where Roxanne is coming in. My startup, come to the stage. So, Roxanne is already a, a successful entrepreneur. She already made it one step further than you guys did it already. She already made a secured investment for her company. It's going cargo. Uh, it's a logistic company here in Greece. Um, so, she already knows how to negotiate because she already successfully did it. Maybe you could just say one or two words uh, on how you do it and how you actually made it. Hi, uh, I'm Hopla Chowkri. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you do? Yeah, I'm oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm here in Greece for four years now, and my company's Joint Cargo, which is like an air ticket, not for but then for truck drivers. So, or like an Uber, you could say. Uh, and I've just closed my first uh, financing and hired my first employee. Very good. So, I think everyone who is looking forward to today is exactly the same like her. And uh, now we're going to have her lawyer. So you should have that in here. And uh, Naya is going to join the panel. So she is like the lawyer for startup businesses here in Greece, actually. So she's there in the business right from the moment, from the beginning, actually. And uh, she's going to be the advisor of John Cargo. Uh, she already founded her own lawyer firm. So if there's any Greek startup interested in getting real good uh, advice, it's good error. Uh, yeah, just say it. One or two words. Hello, everyone. Um, I have been working with startups uh, five years now, actually six, and uh, I have uh, done this work uh, for both sides. So I have been uh, representing startups and funds as well. So I can really correlate. Uh, with the both sides, and I can understand uh, what exactly the CEOs want and what the startups want. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to, to help you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, and now we're coming to the other side of the ring. Our investor, Spiros, who's going to be, who's actually a VC investor, so he's actually even even more an investor guy and a normal business angel. So he's going to present us a little bit what investors are looking for. He's a hard negotiator. Uh, no. Now, now it's going to be tough because you have like two girls in front of you, which you're going to have to be kind. <laughs> it's more complicated, exactly. So he's going to be in the business already since 1999, so with 16 years of investment sitting here, uh, investment experience. He already founded like uh, several investment companies. Now he's managing partner in this always venture, uh, this venture. Um, so go closely, watch what he's this, what he's saying, what he's actually wanting, and because these kind of guys are sitting in front of you when you negotiate. So just say maybe a few words about your experience. Hello everybody, my name is Spiros. Uh, I'm a partner with all these investor partners. Uh, and I've been doing the operating in Greece for the last uh, three years, investing in the early stage information communication technology companies. Uh, we are an entity that is based in Athens and Palo Alto, 
uh, with uh, the strategy of uh, enabling Greek startups to quickly move and establish a base in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, together with my partner, previous funds, we've been uh, investing in early stage companies in the US and Greece for the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And uh, it's been uh, one of the more tedious parts of our business to uh, take care of, of this part of recovery today. Uh, the actual uh, formulation of the agreement with the startup. Thanks a lot. So, uh, what we are doing now, we are just shortly giving you a, uh, an idea of what we're negotiating right now. So, we have a company which is about like that pre valuation, uh, 200,000. So, we're negotiating with um, like, you know, 20% of the investment share. So, we're going to leave that a bit to the negotiation, of course. And here is maybe our entrepreneur. Can you just give us a short idea of what the company is about and then just start? So that's what we're starting with. The negotiation of you know the actual pre-valuation of the of the company and its you know the investment amount. So as a Jay Gargo, so there's a huge problem in the European transfer market. A lot of trucks are driving empty. And with Jerry Cargo, we're trying to fill up those empty trucks by connecting shippers with carriers. So companies that want to ship cargo and truck drivers. So there's a, the, the market uh, is about the uh, logistics market is about 1.3% of GDP, which means that the target market of Jerry Cargo is about 648 million people there. There's a huge potential for this market because this will be transferred into the southeast in Europe and therefore it's expected that the road transport will grow. Right, so, uh, so I would say the road is about sort of, Sorry, uh, we don't have a second microphone, it's a bit difficult to use that one here. Um, so I would say you guys are already starting right now because now it's about company valuation. Okay. So Spirits has obviously have an idea of what this company might be. You know, valuated. You have an idea of what's valued, and so I would leave the stage a bit to you. It's starting into exactly this kind of negotiation now. All right. So this is the market. Okay. <laughs> it's you. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can we just bring this? Let the microphone. Okay, Roxanne. We're obviously very uh, interested in. Uh, working together and becoming your partner in this uh, very exciting new venture. And uh, as you noticed in our in the terms that we presented to you, uh, we have come up with a valuation, a pre money valuation of 800,000 euros for your uh, pre-revenue uh, start. Uh, this valuation was based on the business plan that you presented to us, uh, and we tried to uh, you know, take into consideration the fact that uh, you are starting from a relatively smaller market, which is the Greek market, uh, and uh, your addressable uh, market is actually a very small fraction of, uh, of the size that we are pointing out uh, here. Uh, and we are primarily valuing the company on that basis, uh, taking into account uh, a bit of, uh, of an upside for your potential to expand in the broader European market. I hope you're happy with that valuation. Yeah, uh, I get the point on the market. Of course, uh, indeed, we focus on a small part because uh, I think the key with startups is actually focusing to prove traction and then grow. And I think that Greece is a different market to do this because if you can do it in Greece, at this point, it says then, yeah, it will be a, a good start for the rest of the countries. A bit. Uh, I mean, at this point, I think it's also pretty difficult to discuss the valuation only based on the market, right? So, uh, I would like to uh, go to the next slide and yeah, also define my competitive edge section. So, besides the numbers, I think we're using a different approach than the other competitors in the market. Uh, if you compare the our competitors from like eBay where uh, if you want to transport something as a shipper, you post it online and then uh, they send the request out to all the truck drivers, all the truck drivers have to bid, then there's always back and forth communication, well, a joint garment or more like an Uber, so we know exactly where the drivers are. Uh, 
and you can get straight away a uh, close view of the shippers or the taxi for shippers and airport. So I think that's also a very uh, important point to take into account. In terms of proof of concept, Hello? Yeah. In terms of proof of concept, however, uh, where do you stand? You are still a pre-revenue company. Can you demonstrate how this uh, this model will be uh, effective and differentiated in practice? Yeah, indeed. Well, actually, I came uh, started with my year, and I've been testing all over uh, time. So, uh, first, uh, okay, there's no point of making a product if the uh, market isn't doing for it, right? So, I first focused a lot to uh, companies, uh, like how they do their transport, what their problems are, who they th think a platform would work. Uh, then they would say to me, nah, no, I'm in Greece, nobody's online, uh, this wouldn't work. And I was like, okay, well, if it doesn't work, why wouldn't it work? And I got feedback on which features I need to implement, actually, in uh, the platform. And then um, besides that, um, Based on that, I made my own mock ups right? So my own screenshots on how the platform was look like. And I didn't want to develop something um, to, uh, and then go back to the market, and there were expecting somebody from something else. So I actually developed my platform on paper or PowerPoint to figure out if that's what the market was looking for. So I've been testing a lot, and actually, um, Good testing was also that uh, I'm having uh, my carriers paying prepaid bundles. So um, that means that also validates again the concept of is this really a need in the market. So for now, I've signed up 150 truck drivers within the Athens area paying a prepaid membership. And I've been, I've been, I've been <coughs> new, uh, shippers in the pipeline through my network, and I've been supported by Submet, which is one of the biggest transport companies here in Greece. And Microsoft is supporting us for the next four years, so we have a really strong network uh, in the back. Okay, uh, but we were also trying to measure the risk of uh, how fast you would be able to scale the operation, given that uh, it will prove to be successful in several steps. Uh, in terms of uh, First of all, staffing your, uh, your new company quickly and effectively, as well as expanding uh, into new markets. How are you going to take care of that? Yeah, so luckily I'm not that in the logistics industry, so I have already an network in Holland. I'm uh, in an incubator of the Dutch embassy here in Greece, so uh, this opens up a new network for us as well. So yeah. will, you, will you raise your, your valuation now a bit on that? Because you now you're hearing market traction is already there. Uh, maybe you can also point out a bit that you know, starting from small market, logistic market in Europe, if you're really making it here in Greece, then you go to that big market, uh, having exactly the same problems actually all over the Europe, you know, that, that could be a potential what the investors look for. So is there something like you saying, okay, you know, Greece market is small, but you know, if we're making it to the European market, then that's going to be like a cash cow. Yeah, yeah, that's in my uh, exactly. thesis. I think it's okay for a small agent investor in a good percentage. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, yeah. the problem in Greece is even bigger. It's like a quarter of the trucks in Europe are driving into it. No. And in Greece, it's even bigger, so there's a huge potential. And then I don't want to underestimate our team. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's all about people, right? Well, she only has people on the team, which are already. So, uh, I think also for a startup, it's very important that uh, you have some work experience. And I've been working in logistics for four years, and my developers also have, like, over, uh, Alex has over eight years of development uh, skills. Mm -hmm. So, I think. Uh, that's a great evaluation of it as well. Alright, so what, what is going to be the final valuation now? So we have about 800,000, so what was your idea? <laughs> 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 Alright, so, so now we're going to be fine about the investment amount and now we're going to need the, 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 what we just discussed was about like the, the valuation. Uh, so, pre money valuation at the beginning, as you just listen to the, to, the, to the negotiation, is at the beginning, at an early stage, can be pretty difficult. Because usually, what you do is like a you know, projected cash flow analysis. That's like what we see. So, you're going to do. They really push you through a 
very, very sophisticated due diligence process, uh, which is mainly projecting your cash flow uh, into the future and then just valuing it on, you know, on the basis of that. Uh, if, if you don't have that, then you have to look at what they did at the beginning, market uh, potential and market valuation at that moment. So what, what is there? What is out there? What can you possibly do? Is this market about 200 million in, you know, in total at the end? Or is it about you know, 2 billion, 200 billion? And you're just gonna have a market share of 1% and you're already gonna make like 200, 250 million in that market. That is just obviously more of a potential. Even so the risk is still the same, but the potential of making a lot of money is like huge. That is something that an investor is interested in and might use to value your company higher or lower at that moment if you don't have that market. And then of course, the other picture, picture, uh, you know, uh, factor coming in, are you already having traction? That she got that. She already had traction in the market. She already got people that had prepaid for her product or then she showed that, okay, it's gonna work. That also raises the valuation at that moment a little bit, saying, okay, look, yeah, she's not like you, the risk is not that high, maybe we're really gonna make it. And then, of course, is there really a market differentiation that you're really doing now? Just you know, copying someone else might not be as, as successful. Do you have high barriers already? So we haven't talked about patents at that moment because we don't have a slide here. But patents would be already something which is highly valuable. You know, if you have something, a technology which is safe for the next 10 years, oh, that's, that's going to be something that we can exploit over the next years. So this is what's raising up. So if you're negotiating with an investor, you're going to have to point out exactly all of these good facts that you have in your portfolio to raise up the, the, the valuation. But so now that we're having like a, a pre-money valuation, and which is also like giving the share of the public company, we're coming to the next fact where we're discussing, for example, about like, you know, now that we have a share, who's going to give that to the option pool? Uh, so the, the share, so we, we, we've arrived at the valuation of the company, we've arrived at the share that the, the investor is going to take, and now we're going a bit deeper into the different parts of the term sheet and of the price of, for example, uh, the equity share uh, in, within the company. And one part of that is the option pool. I'm not sure if everyone knows what the option pool is. Uh, is usually you're having one part of the shares uh, you know, preserved for uh, employees, for example, that come into the company's partners that might be coming to the company so to motivate them and give them a bit of equity uh, and with it. And now we're just going to give this again to the ring. Uh, how are you going to share that option pool? Is that purely founder side? Is that you know, investor side? So you can give that to you. Well, I've been actually thinking about this because I think it's very important for the employees to uh, like feel part of the company and it gives like also for a startup to like the extra motivation to go for something. So I would like to propose to set up a 10% uh, option pool for the employees and a 5% option pool for the advisors. Well, I actually agree with you that it's quite important and particularly in a situation where uh, there is a, you are on your own as a founder and uh, most likely you will need uh, two or three senior people to join you as you grow the business. Uh, therefore, I would uh, actually suggest that we increase this and we sum it up to 20% uh, for employees and advisors so that you have a significant pool to, uh, to motivate uh, good people that would not come to, uh, to this uh, young company on a salary basis, given that they would be accomplished in, in what they're doing, and uh, they should be motivated by the upside. Therefore, I think that you need a good option pool and it should be in the 20% in the range. Is that not something we can raise over time? Like, is it... True, true. It's better to have it uh, agreed on uh, at the moment. Since at the term sheet you have uh, centers, um, you have given to Roxanne. Um, you also have a dilution uh, clause regarding the option pool. So we would, of course, we agree on 20%, and maybe you don't even have to uh, say that it's 10 for employees and 10 for advisors. Yeah. Would that be okay for you? She can, she can give away the, the stocks uh, however she would like. It doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. 
much more flexible for our view. You don't need to go through the paperwork and signing if you get 11% for the, 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 the phrase you used, she can give away the stock as she likes, we would have to cover in, in a subsequent paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding our <option two. laughs> of course. Uh, so, um, we would like to um, change the clause uh, regarding the erosion. Uh, so we would like to have this 20% being non-diluted, first of all. So in case after you um, invest in, uh, in your company, uh, then the next one comes, she, it would be for the best of the company to keep it 20% and not being 19 point something, mm -hmm. first of all. And second of all, it would be good to be all of you to be diluted, mm -hmm. and not only uh, Roxanne or the rest of the company, it, the rest of the members of the company uh, that she has already given uh, several shares. So if she gives away 5% um, after somebody works for you one year, um, it would be a pity for him to have 4. Uh, I don't know, 89 So, so what you're saying is that what you're saying is that on a fully diluted basis, uh, the percentage holding, uh, the investors percentage holding the company would not be 20% but would be 16%. Mm -hmm. Okay, given that uh, you accepted the pre-money valuation that I offered, I think that this would be, you know, a nice uh, counterbalance to reach, uh, you know, a mutually satisfactory agreement. Usually it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but in the interest of time. <laughs> exactly. So you've seen that at, even at the beginning, so you haven't you know, thought about like, getting huge employee stocks into your company because you're just starting and just you know, trying to get your, your, your product to the market for the first time. We're already discussing about option pools which are actually you know, going to be really taking effect maybe in the next two years of the company when you're really going into market internationalization, people that you have to hire for your company. You already have to think about it. And dilution, just in order to, because that already came up here as a, as a fact, so I'm shortly trying to explain it. Uh, so dilution really means that who, who is actually giving share parts away here at that moment? And this is something that you have to negotiate, you know, at the beginning, obviously, for Spurs, it would be great. Uh, you know, 20% option pool, you can live with that, as long as it's not to really make his, uh, you know, his shares. Uh, so, you know, the farmers want to raise the company, so why should not they give all their shares away and dilute it? Yeah, and then the negotiation starts like it's here, uh, but you know, honestly, we're going to have to get good people on the, on the panel, and we cannot, you know, we cannot go international as you planned it, you know, we want to go and rock the international markets, like you said, like in the US, and we need people from there. So you should also give a bit of your percentage to that. So as we arrive here very quickly into a very, very common and, and mutual uh, uh, arrangement, um, this is like, you know, something that you should arrive at. At a certain point, the option pool is also in the interest of the investor to have in the company, and he should also be a part of that. Uh, and, you know, in that moment, he said, okay, and we were both accepting that the, the, the initial valuation for it so is exactly how it works. Now we're getting to the next one, which is a bit like connected to the, to the, to the pool. Um, it, it's not really in the term sheet at the beginning, but it is interesting, well, it could be interesting because it's, you know, counter investing. Um, so I give that to, to you guys first. So I truly explain what vesting is. Uh, so vesting meaning usually means so uh, at the beginning you're going to have like uh, maybe 30% of your company, for example. You may have like another founder in your company that has another 30%, and you have an investor in there uh, or 40%. Um, and but what everyone is interested in is if you have a team of founders there, you would like them to be engaged in your company and you stay engaged. You know? Your founder, that you have your co-founder, that you have on board, is saying after you know, half a year, I just, you know, my, my wife got a baby and I'm not really interested in doing that anymore and I'm just leaving the company, you know, after six months. That is it, a problem for everyone because now there's someone leaving with like about, you know, 40% shares of the company and not doing anything anymore for it. Not, not perfect situation. So that's where you put like vesting into the, into the, into the agreement. Because that's also the interest of the investor because they, want to keep people motivated in the company working for it. So that means you're not getting 
you know, right away you're 40% or 25% as an incidental example. If you're, do, if you're leaving, for example, a company which has an investing period of four years, which is pretty long usually, a bit shorter, um, and you would leave after six months, you would end up with only 3.1 to 5% of your company. And this is only fair. Uh, you know, you're starting something, you, know, you get investors on board, you really want to do something, and you're leaving. Uh, that is just not nice, and it should be penalized. So, but if you're staying like three years, four years, and you're you know, going to be entitled to your full share, no problem. Then you can be let go if there's liquidation fully uh, possible for that. Okay, so I give it to you guys, the, the best thing. Okay. Uh, Roxanne, you and your other two co-founders uh, will receive uh, restricted stock. And uh, what we mean by that is that uh, your stock uh, will uh, have uh, a clause that says that uh, you will have to earn it out by working with a company for the next uh, three years. I'm not sure what. <laughs> That's actually for, for the next four years. I negotiate myself down already. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, if somebody leaves or is let go by the company in uh, two years down the road, they will only be entitled to half of their shareholding and they will have to return the other half to the company so that the company will be able to use it to motivate either the, uh, those founders that will stay on or uh, people that will be recruited in order to cover the gap that your co-founder has left. I hope you understand and you agree with that approach. What do you realize? <laughs> Actually, we totally understand the concept and we agree. <laughs> but, there's always a but. Uh, four years is a really long uh, uh, period of time. Um, of course, uh, her company and in the idea, uh, but we have given you a business plan for three years, and you're only giving away uh, 200k, I believe. Yeah, that was the deal. Um, so three years will be for the best, and of course she does not plan on leaving. Uh, she has already worked uh, long hours, and uh, she has selected the team very carefully. Uh, but also, she cannot predict the future, and, and yeah, we would, you would definitely like to, to have the shares going back in order for you to replace your engineer, in, you know, in, in the developer in case he leaves. You would like to have, uh, you know, you would like to see him walk away uh, with uh, 15% or 20% of, uh, of your company. Um, yeah, well, the cliff is. What do you have, like uh, six months and just, three years? Just to make the comment, uh, given you know that you and your co-founders have been working for over a year now on uh, developing this, uh, this schedule, therefore I have reasons to believe that there is a strong uh, affinity among your group and the high probability of you sticking with it uh, in the, the long term. I'm happy with reducing this to, uh, to three years. <laughs> <laughs> What a nice investor. <laughs> I think you can have a lot of negotiations as well. <laughs> so you already seen that. So stories is so nice that we need to give some also some arguments uh, that the that the that startups are actually bring up that moment. So you, there is you, from your side there should be a lot of arguments prepared exactly for you know for these kind of cases. So you have to prove why it is for you important. That, for example, if you want to reduce the vesting period, you want to get like new shares early, you're going to have to make somehow reasonable why that is. Now, I worked on it for about five years, and I proved that I'm going to be on it. I'm not going to leave something that is my baby and I'm going to you know, put it already half of my, my, uh, my time in that. So I put money in that already. So, you know, it, it, I'm in, absolutely. There's no chance in, on that. Um, so these are like the kind of negotiation you know, points that you should bring up at that moment in order to you know, reduce that, things like that into your favor. Uh, and in case, you know, just cliffs and accelerations, it's just more for employees later, um, for example. So if you get an employee on board, um, usually you're not giving them, you know, shares right away. Uh, they, they should stay a little bit uh, in order then, you know, to, to be entitled to it. So either you say, you know, after a year uh, of, of, of working for my company, 
it is sometimes even bound to, to, uh, to, to milestones. You know, if you get a sales guy, uh, why not bounding that to a revenue goal? You know, saying that you know, if we reach next year, uh, you know, 500 or a million uh, or I don't know, 10 million of uh, revenue, then you're getting, of course, your you know, extra 1%, 2% of the company, for example. That is something that might be interesting as well. And one question is first, would you accept also not just the, the time period thing, but would you say, would you give uh, what reduce, for example, vesting periods when you say milestones or reach earlier? So if you would say, you know, for example, she's saying you know, we're going to rule the, the, the green market and we say we're going to have by the end of 2017, for example, 5% of the, the, the green market and they outperform that and say, like, cool, we got to use nine. We've not done this uh, in the past, but it, it's not a matter of the investor. It is a matter of the company. So uh, in this case, we are fully aligned with the, uh, the founders and, uh, and the entrepreneurs in the sense that we're trying to motivate in the best possible way the talent that we are attracting uh, to, uh, to the company. Uh, what, what you're doing is that in many cases, uh, you are, uh, you know, as you may be uh, approaching a liquidity event, uh, and, and that's a dynamic thing, it's not a, a one-round agreement. Uh, you're saying, okay, let's uh, automatically vest all the outstanding stock or a bigger percentage of that so that the people who are working are uh, even more motivated to work towards the liquidity event. By liquidity event, I mean actually selling the company. Uh, so you want... You don't want your people to say, okay, if they sell the company now and I've only invested 20% of my stock, then I'm not really getting what I would like to. So you're saying, okay, you'll be fully vested, i.e., once the company is sold, it's like your, all of your shares are vested, therefore your percentage holding is substantially higher. Uh, so we have agreed on the three years, uh, but uh, the we should also discuss uh, the cliff. So the, the cliff uh, that you're suggesting is for the first founder six months and for the second one three years. So um, I believe we should have actually one year for for uh, the one of six months. Usually we have increase, we decrease, but it would be for the best for your co-founder to have him, uh, you know, attached to the company for one year, uh, which is. Good for you. I don't think you will argue, right? N Naya, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, I, it was badly written. I, I, I never requested a cliff for the founders. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, in, in the case of founders, you ne almost never apply a cliff. They're already in the company, they're working, they're, they're dedicated, they're committed, and in any case, that was the number one criterion uh, for us to, to invest in the company, that we were persuaded that, that we have a, a strong founder team that is dedicated to it. The cliff is for the employees. Okay. And actually, it is given that the management will manage the, the stock option pool uh, with the approval of the board, of course. Uh, is that a veto right you're, you're referring to? Of course. <laughs> we'll discuss uh, it later. <laughs> uh, it is, it is key that, that even in the case that you have made a bad hire, which happens, and uh, it, for example with salespeople it happens more often than not. Uh, you, you can on the one hand give them a motivation from the first day, i.e. from the day they come up on board they know that they have a good uh, holding in the company and they're motivated through it. Uh, on the other hand, if they prove to be, you know, not the right people for the company, uh, the cliff will uh, ensure that they will not leave three months down the road with uh, a good chunk of the company's stock option pool. So that, that's the purpose of the one-year cliff. We agree, right? We will run our own place, flying away with, uh, yeah, with stock options. Okay, great. Uh, well, but since it was badly written and you really you need the uh, the founders working three years and yeah uh, I would suggest that uh, we in decrease it to two years. Uh, actually, I mean that if they live within two years, they should be getting something. 
because I have been working in the company for two years. And it was not again. Uh, yeah, that's something. too Greek on our behalf. <laughs> <laughs> we said three years. <laughs> Let's not have it. <laughs> okay, well, we can see the rest of the clauses and then we can return to this one. <laughs> See, that's how it works. If you see that the, nego that the investor already you know, is too easily you know, uh, uh, convinced by one, we don't just you know, for the negotiate. I choose. All right. So now we're coming to uh, the ocean that we already discussed before, but now in a more broad way. So that means what happened when there is another investor coming in and. You know how are going to be the shares at that moment, especially when there is a so the dilution at that moment means, of course, there's another investor coming in, uh, you know, requesting a certain percentage of the of the shares for his new investment. Uh, then there's going to be, of course, a dilution taking place. So everyone is going to be diluted by uh, the, the new share that's coming in. But the problem really is not really the dilution, but it is the value dilution. So you're going to be you know, there's an investor coming in, you invested like 200,000, there's a new investor coming in, 10 million, and you want to have like 40% of the company for that, that means your value of your shares are actually getting up. And you're going to be fine by not having 20% anymore, but, you know, it's only 10 at that moment. Um, so, but in case you're doing a bad deal, there might be a problem. And then if there's someone coming in and you invested only 200,000 for 20%, and then there's suddenly coming, someone coming in, investing 250,000 for 50% of the company, then you're thinking like, ah, uh, this is not very nice and not very much in my intention actually as an investor, because you know, now the company valuation or the valuation of the share is you know, dropped down by 50%. And that means my investment of 200,000 is now actually only worth 100,000, this is not something that I would like to have. So that's why you know I think spirits would like to maybe impose some uh, anti-dilution provisions, and you would like to not get them. Not the uh, Okay. You know, in, in numerous cases, investors require for uh, uh, you know their holding in the company to remain stable. Uh, unless there is a significant new round. So uh, there is the notion of the qualifying round to start being diluted. We do not work like that and we are happy to be diluted uh, as new money come in. But on the one hand we will have a veto right, which means that uh, we will have to uh, say yes for a new share capital increase to take place. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we will need uh, anti-dilution protection, which means that if the new money comes in at a reduced uh, price per share to the price we paid, uh, you are going to compensate us for, uh, for that loss. Can I ask you first on voting rights, like, are there any specific topics you like voting rights on, or are you on the, on the shareholder, on the new uh, for, for now, uh, that's one of them. It is the veto right on share capital increases. And, uh, and then we will see more. Will we? <laughs> Alex? Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> you know, voting rights comes next. <laughs> so where will you base your voting rights in that term on? Like, what are you afraid of in terms of new investors? Uh, it, is, it is primarily the terms of the round. Uh, that, uh, you know, we're not really uh, giving the company away uh, to a new investor uh, rather than trying to maximize our value, rather than the nature of the investor. We are, we are, we are an institutional investor, therefore we do not have uh, strategic issues, uh, meaning that whether you know, this new investor will be competitive uh, to our activities or whatever. Okay, I totally understand that you would like to uh, reiterate uh, the uh, capital increase, it's common, uh, but I think you're asking too much also having this veto right plus uh, anti dilution. Um, maybe we can negotiate on something in between, like no compensation, since you'll have to say okay at the increase. Um, so you if, if you say OK, according to your veto right, means that you believe it's for the best of the company, it either takes that 
that money for less valuation because it might get it going. Uh, things like that happen all the time. Unfortunately, you don't always get valuation higher and higher. That's, that's a fantastic scenario, but maybe sometimes you just need a push. Uh, so I don't think they should be punished. Uh, the company that you're being partners with together should be punished like, for giving away compensation. Um, yeah, well, what do you think of that? Uh, anti protection is a standard clause and it actually goes hand in hand with uh, the fact that you agree to a significant pre-money valuation for a, for a startup, for a pre-revenue company. Uh, the way that you can justify a significant pre-money valuation is by having a number of uh, safety nets including the anti-dilution. What anti-dilution means is that if we oversold you something and uh, a year down the road you will have to suffer a significant blow uh, through the, a new investor coming in at a significant price, you will be compensated. Now, there are two ways to compensate us. Uh, there is the weighted average anti-dilution protection and there is the full ratchet anti-dilution protection. The latter actually restores us to the same percentage, we rather, it is as if we invested today at the, at the reduced price of the new investor. So there is significant compensation. What I can do is uh, give away the full ratchet anti-dilution and accept a weighted average one. I really understand you, but since it's not a Series A investment, it's only two. Thank you for the 200, of course. I don't want to be yeah, <laughs> messing up the deal. But um, as you know, since you have done bigger uh, deals uh, and bigger investments on this one, uh, it could be a problem for uh, future investors. Uh, they, they don't like it. bigger and uh, yeah, uh, Series B and Series A investors don't really like previous anti dilution clauses, which would, would be for the best for the company that you're partners. Naya, I, 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 I see what you're saying, but we are an institutional investor. This is the way that we work. Uh, and for us, this is one of the standard clauses. Uh, if okay. if you do, you're not happy with them, perhaps an angel investor could actually support the company's purposes in a more effective manner. Okay, so let's go and see what else uh, we need to talk about. And we'll see where we can... Uh, one, one of us can go. We're forward. parking that yeah. as well? Yeah, of course. Okay. We need to, so uh, to be a long negotiation then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we just only, uh, uh, so Spear has already brought up the different anti dilution clauses that could be there uh, are quite complex. I'm not sure if everyone knows what full redshift and what weight leverage approach means. Um, it's, it's a bit complicated, or not. But the full redshift one is actually not too complicated. Um, it should have, because we have more time, maybe we'll just explain that quickly. Um, let me just show you one or two slides in that. So, here's a bit the situation of an investment, for example, taking place with like no anti dilution protection at all. So, what, what is happening here? We have an investor that we're actually coming in, like let's say with Spurs, with like 400,000 in a uh, 1 million cost uh, money valuation. And we got like this, uh, this share, you know, 60% of the founders, 40% of the investor, fine, everything is good. Now we're getting a new round of investment. Exactly that happens with Spiros fears. There's someone coming in who's actually now, now investing 500,000 for 50% of the company, which gives us a share price only of 50 cent. But he invested at one euro. So that means it's 50% less. It's not, not beautiful. So, okay, in this case, he did not put any anti dilution on that. I don't know why. Um, but so, and what, what's happening is that his 400,000 goes down to 200. And you know, he's getting 40,000, so that, that's something you don't want to have. Uh, obviously, that happens also to the, to the founders. Uh, that's only fair. Uh, but you know, this is something that you would like to protect yourself from. So now there are like different ways on how to do that. So the, the more or less you know, middle way of doing it is the way that average formula. It's a bit more complicated, um, but it gives you like that. It actually says that, okay, in case there's something happening like a reduction, we're going to take this share price 
of that I paid actually, and you know modify it with this beautiful nice formula of you know this is the money that I invest, this is the value of the investor that is actually coming in, this is the pre money valuation, this is the other valuation, you're gonna get like a share price of 75 cents suddenly, and this is the that you know, we're taking, and I am getting, you know, this is the anti-dilution protection that comes out of that. You know, he at least gets a bit of compensation for that loss, which is here about like 66,000 or 70,000 on that, you know, and 7% up. And that goes obviously away from the founder. So the founder's going to be diluted, and of course also the investor is going to be diluted, but not full. And full wretched, this is what Spurs would love to have, uh, is I'm not going to lose anything if that happens. So, if there's someone coming in with 50% and you think that's a good deal, you're going to give me exactly 20% of the shares back and I'm going to lose nothing because here it's still 400,000. But what happens to the founders is like, oh my god. Uh, and then you would never maybe do that kind of deal because you're completely losing part of your, your company at the moment. So this is like the negotiation that's going on. Um, I think what, what maybe is... Um, so now we're arrived maybe where I said the, 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 the weighted average uh, solution. Uh, e even that can be further negotiated, right? Naya, there might be other options as well. Regarding uh, dilution. Yeah. Like, not just the weighted average formula, but is there another solution as well? Like full register, weighted average, is there also something other? Like, what? No, actually, usually these are, these are the options. Yeah. Uh, I don't know something like that. Uh, what I would like to share with you is that uh, everything is negotiable. So we're just discussing uh, several clauses, classic clauses, let's say. But you know, these clauses several years ago were not classic. Somebody really invented them in order to have a, a deal with uh, Spiros and uh, with Khan. So if you know, if you get a, an idea, then you only share and you negotiate. And, uh, do you have any other options? Let, let me make a comment actually going back to your uh, initial uh, intro on valuation. Mm -hmm. in, in startups, uh, actually the, the funniest part uh, or most frustrating in some cases uh, is negotiating valuation with academics because they expect that uh, this will be a deterministic process that will lead to uh, a result that uh, will be objective. It's far from it. You know, this is more of, a, of, a, of an art, of a, of a sense uh, and a compromise that, that you're going after. And uh, that's, that's because you're talking about a startup where you have no numbers, you have no visibility about how we will, it will develop, you have numerous unknown parameters that, will can, that, that can go one way or the other. So you're trying to get to a, to a ballpark figure in terms of valuation and then try to, uh, to hook it up with a number of other terms that include, uh, among others, the anti-dilution protection. So you're saying, you know, I will go for a larger number in the pre-money valuation, but you will protect me through the anti-dilution protection and some other things that we will discuss as we proceed. Exactly. So that's why I'm always saying, okay, let's let's move on. So we're not breaking uh, up <laughs> uh, over a month close. We go through it. At the end of the day, it's a negotiation. It won't be a fair negotiation if if you win all the battles, right? Uh, for for both of us, somebody will be uh, will, will leave the room with a sad face if uh, he doesn't win, win either one battle. So that's why you have to discuss the whole document and don't say, oh no, you didn't give me money, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> and we're actually having also to some even also very, very interesting and important clauses, which is now, for example, the liquidation preference, uh, which is also very much connected to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the valuation of the also, and of course, uh, highly negotiated. Uh, okay, so I give you that. I think Spurs has an idea of what the liquidation preference he thinks about. Can you try to negotiate that? Or a better. 
according to our terms, we will be receiving preferred stock. And uh, one of the preferences that we will receive is uh, liquidation preference. And in order to explain what this means is that uh, in a liquidity scenario, and that actually means selling the company, uh, the way that the proceeds will be distributed is that uh, we will receive our investment first, and that's the preference. And then we will participate with uh, the common shareholders on a pro rata basis. Now, what this practically means is that uh, if we achieve our target scenario of selling the company at a very high valuation, instead of the 20% or the 16% holding that we agreed on a fully diluted basis, we may actually effectively receive something that may be 17%, a bit higher than our nominal percentage. But you must be ready to, uh, to accept that uh, if uh, this is not uh, an agreeable scenario, i.e. we're selling the company for a couple of million euros five years from now, then we may un end up getting, instead of 16%, 60% of the proceeds through the liquidation preference. So are we referring to No, uh, we do not... Uh, some investors require that they first receive a multiple of their investment. So there is 2x or 3x liquidation preference. In our case, what we uh, suggest in our term sheet is a single liquidation preference. Okay. <laughs> I got the liquidation. Uh, I'll head over to Mary. <laughs> you should have said two or three on the two of sheets. <laughs> I should go <laughs> higher. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, of course, it's common. I understand that you have raised money from your investors, and you need to, uh, you know, to keep the money back as well. Uh, I, I agree, actually, on one X. And uh, pro rata, okay, maybe we, we should, yeah, of course, maybe it's very difficult to have one exit. You, you always have to remember that the investors want their money back, they're not a charity, right? Um, so you both together need to, uh, to create money from, uh, from zero, from, um, depending on the, the maturity of the company. Um, so pro rata, uh, this would be 16%, you believe? The, the way the, the, your, lawyer, your lawyer has described it, or maybe it would be more? By 16, I meant that uh, the 20% that we agreed in the beginning uh, of the valuation yeah. is on a fully diluted basis, i.e. after the stock options, 16%. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I meant. Okay, so I think it's fine. And we can also, please remember that, we can discuss the, the ones <laughs> because we have parked. <laughs> yeah, because that was already very nice of, 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 of him actually, because you know, sometimes, especially in order to drive uh, a valuation up in companies, uh, which is usually happening in tech companies, for example, you guys when you're listening to, you know, when you're watching the news, you see the deals that they're raising, and they're saying, yeah, we got like company valuation of 20 million. Usually there is a clause like that maybe in the contract. No one sees that because it just looks cool in the news. We got a company value like about 20 million, but then they might have a multiple in there. You know, we just you know we just invested to one million in the company maybe, but we put a, a multiple on that of three, for example, uh, because in order to protect us, because this valuation is so high that it's you know in the case that you're not going to achieve that, uh, we just going to have to be protected that we're you know getting at least a bit of of, of a profit out of that. So. You, you are really, so if there's someone coming to, in order to explain it again, so really it means Spurs right now invested 200,000. If he's really getting for the multiple, it means right, you know, before you are given any money to anyone else, you're going to give him with like the three times thing, well, like his 200,000 investment plus three, plus, you know, another 600. So that means about 800,000 he already walks away with that. No negotiation about that. This is what he gets. Point. You know, that is maybe the beginning fine, but if you have like larger investments in a later stage, there could be a lot of money. 
if, if you get like a lot, you know, a huge new investor coming in, you know, giving you a perfect valuation, you can be fine with that actually. You know, it, at the end, if you're really achieving your company valuation that we're discussing about, you're getting real good investment in that, you know, this, this little bit of what he's getting more is not a lot. But if you are, have to do a term which is actually not that perfect, and you get like actually a low valuation, and maybe just three million or something, he already walks away with like you know over thirty percent, maybe even forty percent of of the whole money that was actually made. So, but you know, if you get like a huge deal, you know, he's just making maybe out of sixteen percent, seventeen, eighteen percent. Right, that's still not a big deal, even with the multiple in it. So this is like a bit determined that. So even so, that's why a lot of people try to drive that and. Um, if you keep your company valuation as these guys did pretty reasonable, it is actually maybe either the participant you prefer. You say, hey, look, you know, we're at least getting uh, a double of our investment with us. That means preferred shares are counted. And then the preferred shares are also counted as common stock account. So that means, you know, we participate in our preferred stock first, so we get like 200,000. And then we are splitting the rest of the liquidation with the 20% that we're actually, you know, having of the common stock. That would be like the double dip option. If you get like straight, then it means only 20%, and then the common share comes, and then that's it. That would be obviously a, a, a very fair uh, uh, one that is not protecting anything. So, okay, but Spurs was already very nice. He was easily negotiated done. I think we can so Alex, can, can, can I make a sure. an yeah, extra sure. comment on that? Of course, yeah, please do. Where liquidation preference can become an issue is if you have multiple rounds. Uh, you know, then you raise money again and again, and you have four rounds, and in each round you have liquidation preference, which actually creates a cascade. So once the company is uh, successfully sold, then the last investors will take their money out, and then the ones before the last, and blah, blah, blah. And then once they're all covered with the liquidation preferences, then it will be on a pro rata basis, i.e. all the shareholders will get what uh, entitled to. And, and that makes it a bit complicated. And more importantly, in the case that, there is, that it is not a very successful scenario, it is easy that the founders will, will end up getting nothing out of it. Thanks, sir. So see that? So that's why, for example, the next round he would like to get actually that his preferred shares would get him, for example, so he, that's why he preferred A, preferred B, preferred C, usually, and that's like the cascade that he was talking about. Um, so he would, for example, like to discuss something like, can I convert my, you know, preferred A then into preferred B, so that I'm at least at the same level with the new investors, or in which terms is that going to take place? But that's like a later round, so we're not going to be there right now. Okay, so now we're coming back to the voting rights that we already started to discuss on the edge dilution part. Uh, we just put a few caps here, but I'll leave that to you. And I think Spurs put it already something in his term sheet uh, of voting rights and uh, protective provisions that you already want to have there. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Maybe you just can explain what you would like to have, and uh, we see what Roxanne can accept. Uh, yes. This is becoming a venture-backed company, and we're hoping to grow it like that. Therefore, we need to introduce proper governance. And uh, even though the founders should and are compensated by having a very, you know, the, the vast majority of the equity of the, of the company, uh, you should understand that uh, the issues of control are not uh, on, on a pari passu basis with uh, the shareholding. The investors, and in this case, this first round, it is ourselves, and in the future, hopefully, we'll have many more, uh, should be entitled to a number of, uh, you know, to, to uh, having a word on a number of key issues of the company. The first and most important is the, comp the constitution of the board, the board of directors, given that companies are managed by boards and not by general assemblies. Uh, therefore, uh, we need to have uh, a word on how the board of the company is constituted and set up. And that's the most important one. Uh, and going beyond what it says here, uh, in a three-member uh, board that we will establish, 
the investors would like to have one seat, one board seat. The founders, the common shareholders, will have one board seat and we would like to have uh, the third one uh, reserved for an uh, independent uh, board member that we will jointly uh, select uh, you know, from, from people we may identify in the market. And beyond that, there are a number of key decisions such as uh, liquidating the company, uh, selling the company and raising new, uh, new money. Uh, on which we would like to have a veto right. Okay. Uh, well, I've been advised that since we are a startup in a very early stage, that we don't want to overstructure the company at the moment. So, what about giving, because having a board of directors is too much, could I offer you a seat in the board of advisors? And, you know, we can have still the rights to which you want to. Control. You know, a, board on, uh, a seat on the Board of Advisors is for advisors. We are actually an investor. Uh, and this is our job, rather than advising companies. We are investing our money and then advising them. So it doesn't really make sense. Uh, as an institutional investor, uh, we have a policy of you know, participating actively in the management of all the companies we invest in. Actually, people who invest in our fund expect this from us. Uh, we are professional investors, therefore we should uh, actively engage in, uh, in the management of the companies we invest in, uh, rather than just invest money. Uh, but, 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 you know, uh, given that this is an angel round, and uh, I, I do understand that this is a small amount of money that uh, may be badly allocated if we were to restructure this company, what I would be ready to compromise with is that uh, we work on a lighter structure for, for now, but we agree that uh, in a year from now, as we will be raising the next round, that would be uh, one of the new uh, instruments that will be put in place. Yeah, I think I need to an A round. That's the position. You're ready to give it away one year from now? I mean, to, to develop uh, a board, not just giving away a place. Yeah. <laughs> so, I understand that you would like to protect uh, your money, right? The way they're being spent. Um, and we have no problem with that. Right? Uh, so I suggest uh, we use the, the clause um, saying that Rotan can spend money up to a certain amount and you can negotiate the amount that, that would give you the control you would like over the money and it also would be best for Rotan not to be chasing you know, uh, the investor uh, around that has the the member seat for signatures for everyday, uh, you know, everyday errands. It will be much more flexible for her. And I think we can give you this way the reassurance you need for the money. Um, I think you can find an amount, uh, like, I don't know, maybe 50,000? We, we, we should have a budget. We, we should have a budget. Uh, that we that we agree uh, as we launch, uh, you know, this this company, uh, you know, after we have invested in the company, and uh, whatever is in the budget uh, is discretionary for the management of the company to uh, to use in terms of funds, and we could also have, you know, a, a small uh, margin uh, that that can be, uh, you know. On a monthly uh, OPEX basis, we could say that up to 10% is discretionary. But for anything over and above that, I think that the, that the management should go to the board of the company and receive approval uh, for uh, expense over and above the budget. Well, I also have uh, another uh, idea. Uh, we can uh, say yes to uh, not having any loans or not. Uh, in protecting the company in any way. So, I don't think, I mean, that, that would be great for you because this is what you're afraid of. And, yeah, I mean, what would be good for you? What amount would be good for you in order to know that uh, they're, they're okay? Because, like, if, if you use 
uh, uh, if you have an agreement for 15,000, let's say, uh, euros, then you have to get above 15,000 euros, you should be uh, having his written consent. Would you like to wait it or um, how exactly? Yeah, I would like to start with third, because I think it's better to work with the fixed amount than the percentage. I think what he actually suggested already is really, really good, because you have, you have a budget anyway, you plan the bit where you're, oh sorry. Yeah, because oh. Well, sorry. Because every difference, right, based exactly. on the budget, sort of the difference so, in the budget. So if you suddenly, you know, plan like marketing expenses of about, you know, 20,000 at a certain point and you're spending 40, mm, that, you know, needs approval at that moment if you want to change it to that. You are you know, overspending by 2,000. He says this is still fine, um, but you know all of that, which is going to be above that, he would like to know. And so this is still fine because you don't have to do anything. Because you know 20,000 means you can spend 20,000. He's not even asking him because he already said yes. Yeah, it's fine. 20,000 at a moment we said yes. But if you spend more, yeah, yeah. I can join the close to have you both happy. So don't worry. Perfect. See. <laughs> And although uh, paying dividends, this is uh, also, this is fine, uh, we usually have it. Um, so, of course, you will need, he's okay in order to, to pay any dividends, and most of the times we, we don't pay dividends, uh, maybe four or five years after the, the establishment of the company, that's uh, the good scenario. That, that would be an interesting problem to have in the startup, <laughs> having to distribute dividends. That would be a fantastic investment. <laughs> Uh, so raising, uh, oh yeah, of course, altering the scope of the company, that's, that makes sense because he really loves your team, but he also, he's also giving money away for uh, this, business, this business plan we have uh, presented and we have pitched already. Yeah, yeah, all the rest are fine. We, we are fine. You're very reasonable, skills. <laughs> we, we are happy to be <laughs> partners with you. Out of your experience, what would be other voting rights protected provisions that would be you know, harder than even the ones? Because in the ones that we just discussed, I guess, are pretty basic. So these are the ones that you're anyway always going to have in that. So, but sometimes there's other things, maybe out of your both experience, where the startups should be aware of that. Kind of the, the one that I already mentioned before is uh, <coughs> compensation issues. Hiring and firing <coughs> key executives, not, not each and every one in the company, and compensating them uh, salary and stock option wise. So that's, that's a, an area where we, you need to uh, have a word. Now, let me make a comment. Depending on how mature the company is, and Roxanne correctly negotiates this, that this is a, a younger company where you know, putting certain bells and whistles could be counterproductive. But assuming that this is a more structured, first round or second round company, you have a functional board. And then it is not a matter for the one investor, but it is the market of, it is an issue, it is a matter for the board to decide, uh, which already creates a more balanced view because on the board you have the executives, the founders, you have the investors, and you may have also professionals that are the independent board members I mentioned that actually create this, this balance uh, of opinion and a key point uh, an investor representative on a board should act in the best interest of the company rather than their own fund and, and that's another thing to, uh, to bear in mind so uh, there's an urgent email for uh, the uh, entrepreneur and I think that this will actually help close this deal much faster. UPS just emailed you. They want you for their uh, exclusive uh, company partner. So I mean, this is like a huge partnership, right? I think we can we can say that we're signing right now. Whatever they say, right? Okay, we're good. Okay, because uh, everyone is also very very hungry. So. <laughs> So I think that we should like start uh, with the signings and uh, kind of close this up. Yes? Excellent. I'm moving. Okay, perfect. I'm moving to uh, Alex. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, ideally, it is like, you know, you're ordering a lot of pizzas and you're staying like about for about six hours in the room and just trying to find... <laughs> when it, it's getting even easier usually when he gets like hungry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, don't feed the investor. Okay, so we're going to send you this, we're going to send you a little presentation around so you can have a look at that. We're going to put also a little more background information into it so that you can have, have a really close look on all of these different terms, we can send you also an uh, example term sheet, how it usually looks, so that you at least have like, the first idea of what an investor is going to present to you on that. Uh, I hope it already helped you. So we can maybe accept one, two questions or something, or is it over? Because you have to leave. If it's going to be fine for you, to be starving for about like more than 10 minutes or something, we can offer like about like, two questions. Two. Yeah, two questions. Okay. Is there anyone? Maybe it already we want to. Or you can find that you're not Right That's also true. Just yeah. let them grab something first week, so never go between someone and... And that's it. Serve. Exactly. Don't go between, go after. I would like to add one, one more thing. That, uh, when uh, raising money, you're not actually only raising money, as you have seen from the negotiation, you're choosing a partner. So you want to be really... Uh, you don't need me to be uh, fine with your investor. You need to be fine with your investor. You need to be uh, aligned. So uh, just in case you have already accepted the clause, as Spiro said, regarding hiring, let's say, which is a strict law, you should be you know, really connecting with the investor. Uh, for me to say, yeah, I, I totally understand why you need team and you're going to be paying him that, uh, that amount of money and you're going to be giving him that amount of stock options, etc. And yeah, it's great. Rather than he saying, no, you should be doing that yourself and you're a startup and you don't need that and this is not and this is expensive for no reasons. So that's just a, a hint. And if you're good, everybody will want to invest in you and you need to believe in you. Okay, I'm not coaching, I'm a lawyer, but <laughs> it's very important and I've seen that before, so that's why I'm sharing. And good luck, everyone. <laughs> and thank you. Very good, so that's very true. I mean, this is only the beginning of a partnership, right? So, and the, the, the things that come out there are really important. I want to thank you so much for taking all this time, and we would like to Alex, first of all, for leading this. Thank you, and for Barry, again. And to Roxanne, Naya, and Sears, the joined us and shared wisdom. Perfect. Okay, so guys, right now we have the lunch. Uh, please, you have, you all have an email that you must have received? Yes? Okay, so that's for the voting for your startup startup. Now, in order to be considered for the uh, competition, you have to vote. So check your emails, votes, and your